So welcome back. Uh, we are now going for the uh, session session uh, 14. And I know it's quite difficult. I will try to be provocative so that I don't lose some of you in the process. <laughs> so, 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 so that's, that's, the, uh, that's my task. Uh, this session is about national security strategy development and implementation. And I think my, my friend Emil might have done a great job to introduce this, uh, this session. And I just want to start first along the way from the first, the module one, and then we start with module two. And module two, as I mentioned, is about catalyzing strategic solutions. Because by the end of the day, we would like you really to equip you with certain tools that can help you to address some of the mega trends that we have diagnosed and discussed in the first week. So national security strategy is one of the options that can help the security sector leaders to address these complex, complicated, uh, complex uh, security threats. But before I, I start, I would like you, based on your knowledge in your country, whether your country or countries have national security strategy. If your country is having national security strategy, finished national security strategy, please can you raise your hand? Countries that have, have national security strategy. Okay. Uh, okay. Na countries that have finished, including, including, including US also. Okay. So, what about the countries? In, do you know whether your country is having national defense policy? National defense policy. National defense policy. I, I, know, I know there's an issue here between national security strategy and national defense policy. But if you raise your hand first because of national security strategy, and you want to change your mind, just wait until we, we, uh, we come to the, uh, we, in the, the last of the session. First, uh, this session, as I mentioned, is about national security strategy. And as Emil said, one of the ways we started in the Africa Center, we decided to map out what is really what is happening on the continent in terms of availability of policies, especially policies related to the national security strategy. And we discover many countries, most of the countries, they do not have national security strategy. And in fact, sometimes if they do have, they do have defense strategy. But even the few that are having national security strategy, those strategies are in most cases formulated with the exclusion of the citizen. Sometimes these strategies are classified and not even accessed by the citizen. Sometimes some of these strategies focusing on the state or regime but not focusing on the citizen. And that led us to a journey in Africa Center, then what can we do? So we went to the, and I'm just highlighting some of these points. African Union and even Rex, they have a very explicit commitment for the member state to develop an inclusive and participatory uh, security strategies. Then we said, although there's this commitment, but these countries, they do not have national security strategies. This is where we went in to assess the status of national security strategies on the continent. And we, through a process, we found that the countries, even though they have intention 
to develop national security strategies, they may not have the tools how to develop national security strategy. But one of the biggest debate we have in the Africa Center is who's security and what security. And I think I just want to highlight a few points. The state-centric security or regime-centric security we found is not delivering the service to the citizen on the continent. And that's why we shift the debate from regime security and state security to the people-centered security. And if any strategy is going to be developed, it should be focusing on those. And then we say most of the African countries, they don't know or they don't have the tools or they don't have experience to develop national security strategy. So we went in to look for how to develop a toolkit. And a toolkit is the idea is to assist it's not, it's not, it's not a, a, a blueprint. It's to help the African countries of how to develop their national security strategy and what the process they could be in. And this is the one you have here. I hope all of you, you have this copy of the National Security Strategy Development in Africa Toolkit for Drafting and Consultation. And this is going to be the focus. Definitely this toolkit is not a panacea to solve most of the African problem, but it's only to allow you, it's a menu, you contextualize it to your context. So on the basis of this one, I just want, and actually my colleague Emil always they said, this toolkit is an African toolkit. It is not American. In fact, even the, the developed country could even learn from this toolkit because we conducted it in a very thorough process that is unique to Africa. And we anchor it to our values, to our experience on the continent. So only it is used, don't say it is something coming, being prescribed somewhere. It is, it is your document. So what do we want to achieve from this session? At this session, few things we would like you to go by the end of this session. One is to have an understanding, the rationale, for having a national security strategy. Why do you need a national security strategy? And what are the prerequisites for you in developing national security strategy? And, and then to have an idea about the key elements. What are the elements that you would like to see in a national security strategy? And the second is to share with you some of the typical phases that you need to follow in developing national security strategy. And these are common faces that may not be unique. This country may have its own way of, 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 of dealing with these, these faces. And then we'll be discussing also some of the key challenges in the development and the implementation of national security strategy. I think what some people say, Africa is not in short supply of a good document, good strategies. But the challenge always is how to implement these strategies. And the last one, the role of leadership in the formulation and the design and the implementation of the national security strategies. We hope these are things we set to ourselves, maybe you will be able to have them, to achieve them by the end of this uh, session. In order to start the debate, we have a well, very seasoned friends with whom I, we engage together. Uh, and I would like to introduce the bio, although you have the bio with you. But yes, I want to, to briefly share with you that, that bio. Uh, the first is Dr. Feli Shipu. She uh, is one of the, a very, a very a, a seasoned expert. Is the person we consulted when we finished drafting the national security strategy to review the national security strategy toolkit. And she did a remarkable job in, in reviewing it. And that's why we're having her today with us so that to share with us some of the objective that we set. Um, she's an independent expert in conflict and security 
uh, for over 14 years experience. Uh, she is a roasted uh, uh, expert for the International Security Sector Advisory Team, which is a very international team, whereby you can have a pool of experts on the issues to do with security and, and, uh, and policy making. And previously, she worked at the Geneva Center for Security Sector Governance. We call it DCAF, and is one of the leading uh, institutions in the area of the security sector. And, and also she worked with uh, Fury Universitat uh, Berlin and also a visiting uh, uh, scholar at the Kofi Annan Institute for Conflict Transformation at the University of Liberia. And also a fellow at the Simpson Center in Washington, DC. And then a Swiss piece in, in, in Bern. She holds a master's degree from the Geneva Graduate Institute and a doctor uh, from the Otto Soho Institute of Political Science at the Fury University of Berlin. So she's a really a very seasoned, and I just want to, to share with you, we just came, we went with her and Emil and Joel to the Southern Africa countries, especially in Botswana. This country invited us to conduct a, a workshop on the national security strategy based on the demand. And we went and we spent about uh, five days with the, uh, with the leadership of security sector in, uh, in Botswana. So we are so happy having her, she will join us in this. And then the second is uh, Mr. O.C. Dixon. As again, he's a, he's a friend, he's somebody attended one of our workshops on the national security strategy development. And she came with some group and some friends also from Ghana, and they went back after the after the attending the, the, the workshop. And they went back home and they started informing the leadership about the need to develop the national security strategy. And indeed, as the president talked about it, President of Ghana, very proud that they managed to produce their national security strategy. And uh, and Dixon played a very big role. Uh, in the uh, in the drafting of the national security strategy, I know some of you here from Ghana will also help us in in uh, in in, uh, in in sharing the experience of, of of Ghana. So Dixon is is a litigation lawyer, and uh, and he is also adjunct lecturer and board member of the Ghana Financial Intelligence Center and national focal point for the International, International Criminal Court. Uh, he's also a member of the Ghana Bar, the International Bar Association, and the World Association for Medical Law, and the International Society for Nuclear Law, and the World Institute for Nuclear Security. But Dixon is coming with a very practical experience. How did they do it in Ghana? And, uh, and, uh, and and we are so happy having two of them. The way we would like to share the discussion, first we would like to start with, uh, with Fairley, Dr. Fairley. And really would like Dr. Fairley to share with us and this on her experience in reviewing this toolkit, the National Security Strategy Toolkit, to take us through and to share with us the rationale for having a national security strategy development. And here I want to state the context matters. And also the link between the national security strategy and democratic security governance and how the national security strategy can make a difference in delivering safety and security to the citizen and the state. We would like her also to share with us some of the common faces in development of the national security strategy and the typical elements that we would like to see in any national security strategy. And it's particularly, we would like to focus on the articulation of a national security vision and its link to national values and national interests. And how can you assess 
the security and risk in a country and how the national security side could help in the division of labor among the different actors in the security sector. And how can national security strategy could help in terms of the coordination among the security actors? And the bigger issues, how can we make a strategy implementable? And then the whole other issue of, of civilian oversight of the security sector. And last, we would like how to share that some countries started developing their, their national security strategies. What are some of the challenges in the process of developing national security strategy? Because it's not, it's a very bumpy process. It's a lengthy process. So what are the lessons learned so that we can be able to share with you? And in particular, in terms of the implementation of the strategy. And to highlight also the important role of leadership in the whole entire process of the development and the implementation of national security strategy. That is Dr. Fairley. Now we'll move the discussion now to focus on the case of Ghana. And that's why Dixon will come in. And what we'd like Dixon to do is really to share with us, how did they do it in terms of the process from the initiation and the rationale, what was the idea behind having a national security from the perspective of Ghana? I know the president talked about it and he articulated very well that in order to address these challenges, Ghana took it upon itself to be guided by a policy in order to address these security challenges. And then to stress to us also, although the president talked very eloquently about the whole, about the role of the political leadership in the process. We would like also um, Dixon to describe briefly the process of drafting national security strategy. Um, how to designate an agency to lead the process and how they started drafting the key elements of national security strategy and how did they conduct the consultation with the key stakeholders in the security sector. And, uh, and, and, and how can you build a consensus in case we have a divergent views in the process of consultation? How can you build a consensus? And how is the process of approval, dissemination, and the communication of the, of the document itself? And what are the, some of the challenges during the process and how such challenges were overcome? And in particular, it would be good to share with us whether the document itself, especially in the security sector with a dominant culture of secrecy, uh, whether the, whether the uh, to what level the citizen like the use women or media or even opposition to be were engaged in the process of drafting national security strategy. And also the issue of the, should it be a classified document or should it be public? And last, what are the, to share with us the experience of Ghana uh, in terms of the, uh, the lessons learned and how they managed to make the process inclusive and how they managed to shift the focus to the people rather than the, uh, the game. And what are some of the critical, uh, some of the critical challenges and the quality of leadership that needed in the process of the development of national security strategy. So with those, those talking points, with, these are the things, this is the way we would like to, to, to continue. And uh, I would like to call upon now uh, Dr. Feli to start the, uh, our, our, our dialogue and discussion. So Dr. Feli, you are most welcome. Thank you, Dr. Luca, and hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be joining you today. Um, with you all today, and I would love to have been joining you in person, but it's also a moment to be grateful for hybrid formats. And as Dr. Luca has uh, outlined, we're gonna cover today some of the ground around national security strategy development policy and, and strategy making. And this is, I think, one of, the, one of the, the, the best place to start with this is really at the very beginning. You'll see that the, the title of this session is National Security Strategy Development 
and development, the NSSD in the process is really important because one of the things that we saw in the process of developing the toolkit is that it is the process itself, which is fundamentally important. So if we could go to the first slide, please. Exactly. So when we say the words national security strategy development, we really want to underline that the idea of a process to create a unified national strategy for democratically legitimate defense and public security provision. Now, this means that when we talk about NSSD, we're covering both national security policy, but then also national security strategy. And this is also something that is important because you'll hear both of these terms you'll hear that they're often used interchangeably um, or that meanings are quite confused. But really it's, it's important to keep a simple definition and we break it down this way. National security policy is the what. It is the key statement of what a government intends to achieve for its national security. It's the highest level statement of a nation's values, its objectives, its priorities for national security, for public safety across all of its security actors. So that's you can think of it in terms of the objective, the destination. That's then distinct from the idea of a strategy, which is about how do you get to that destination? What means, resources, division of labor do you put in place in order to be able to get there? So the strategy part is the how to achieve the objectives of the national security policy. It has to be a practical instrument for coordination and planning at every level of, of administration throughout the security sector. And it's really, so this is why we talk about national security strategy development, because you can't think about the how, you can't think about how you're going to achieve something if you haven't defined your objective. That's the policy part. So this is why we talk about NSSD as including both policy and strategy but in different national contexts, those words will be used in slightly different ways, which is also now, I'm, I will be curious to learn and maybe we'll learn in the questions, whether you would change your answer to Dr. Luca's opening question about whether your country has a national security policy or a defense reform policy or a strategy in place, because sometimes we see that what is called policy is actually more strategy or what is called strategy is actually more policy or sometimes it's called something completely different, like a vision or a roadmap or a white paper. There's many varieties. The point here is not to get hung up on terminology because what's really important in all of this is why are you doing it? Why would you go through this national security strategy development process, right? And there's a, quite a number of reasons. The first reason is that an, in, a national security strategy provides a framework for democratic oversight and accountability. You cannot oversee what has not been clearly stated. A security sector cannot be held accountable for using its resources well, for performing its mission effectively. It can be neither condemned nor praised if there is no clear objective. And so uh, a national security strategy is a key framework for putting in place all of the checks and balances which are intended to make sure a security sector does what it's supposed to do. A national security strategy is also an instrument that communicates a message to the outside world. It's a clear statement to the neighbors on a regional basis or to the international community as a whole about the national values of a particular country and what it is that the stance this country intends to take in terms of international relations. Um, is it a, um, a country that's committed to peace, to upholding international order, to cooperating with its neighbors, to a defensive posture or not? Uh, so in that way, a national security strategy, the parts of it that are public, can send a really important message on a regional and international basis. So that's the second reason. Another reason to develop a national security strategy is that it allows for the security sector to come together around an idea of security provision, both for the state, but also for its citizens, for the population, that's based on inclusive national priorities because the process itself should also be inclusive and based on national values. A national security strategy also um, needs to prove is also a really 
practical tool for providing strategic guidance for the security sector. When we say security sector, and I'm sure you've covered this already, we mean more than just the fighting forces or, or the disciplined forces or the uniformed forces, however you want to describe them. We mean all of the institutions of the state that are involved in providing security, in managing security and overseeing security. So that's what, so the national security strategy needs to play a coordination role amongst all of these different actors and create a clear division of labor between them. What are they each supposed to be doing? And amongst them all, have they covered the entire range of, of aspects and, and, and activities and missions that are necessary to live up to security provision on this national basis? Another purpose for developing a national security strategy is that it's a really it's it's, an, it's a critical basis for making sure that resource use within the security sector is cost effective, sustainable, and efficient. You cannot manage resources in that way if you don't have a clear statement about what you aim to achieve, how you're going to achieve it, and then whether or not you did it that way. So national security strategy making is is really critical for having transparent national budgeting processes that include the security sector. If we think about security as a public service, then the security sector needs to be subject to those same principles of, of rational budget management and resource use that every part of the national, of the national um, apparatus is subject to. A national security strategy is also an opportunity for creating dialogue with the public. It's actually a really important tool of communication between uh, security sector professionals, those involved at the highest levels of administration and politics, but also the public that they're intended to serve. It can be an important moment to promote informed, transparent dialogue um, that really builds public trust in the security sector and in the state itself. And that also has then really positive knock-on effects for, for the security sector, it makes it easier for the security sector to do its job if the public clearly understands its own rights and obligations. And indeed, a national security strategy is a really good tool for stimulating public awareness about their rights and obligations in a way that can enhance that kind of security sector effectiveness. So as you can see, there is um, a, a long list of good reasons to develop a national security strategy. And this is partly why so many, so many countries on the African continent have, have decided to embark on this process. Um, and indeed, are, are some of them are more than um, advanced and leading the way, as Dr. Lucas said, for many parts of the rest of the world. Um, you can maybe hear from my accent that I am from New Zealand, and New Zealand is a well-known small democracy that does not have a national security strategy or policy and is right now engaged in a very public discussion about why it would be useful to have one and how to develop it. So just to say that this is an international experience that, that, um, that many African countries are engaged with. So if that gives you a sense then of, of why it's useful to develop it, and, and you'll find all of this material also in your toolkit, we can move then to the next slide, which uh, looks at what do we mean in more detail. When we say national security strategy development, okay, you just sit down and write the document, yeah? No, <laughs> we have found um, in comparing experiences across, uh, across a number of countries that actually it's better to think of it as a process. And we've broken it down into seven phases, but in fact, every country needs to make its own way through this process. And it could be that in a national experience, there are more or there are less phases or they're constructed slightly differently depending on the resources and the planning process and the political conditions available. Context is key, and this is a tool for national ownership of security policy. So it's really important that this be a national initiative that doesn't follow an international recipe, um, even if you can learn and be inspired by other experiences. So the first phase that we look at is called planning initiation. 
Now, planning and initiation might sound simple, and in many ways it is, but it's actually a really critical moment in the whole process. The rest of the process may stand or fall, depending on yeah. just how just well you well can do it. Sorry? Can I go on? Yeah. So the planning and initiation process, part of the process, is the point where the you need to have whoever has initiated this process, whoever has decided that this process of national security strategy development is a good idea, that that authority, perhaps it's a national security um, administrator, perhaps it's a coordinator or a coordination function at the highest level, it might be the prime minister's office, it could be the presidency, whatever high level political body has initiated this process needs to make a plan. At this stage, before you move to the second phase, it needs to be clear who is doing what, what resources are available, how long it will take, and who will be involved at what stage of the process. If those elements aren't in place early on, that's likely to cause problems later on. If once that's in place, then you can move to phase two. And this is the part where we call pre-drafting. And even at phase two, we are not yet beginning to draft a national security strategy. At this stage, we're preparing to draft. We talk, think about this as the moment to conduct security sector assessments, threat assessments, and stakeholder analysis and mapping. These are three key tools that are very useful at this stage. Think about it in terms of a security sector review or assessment is the moment where you need to look inward and ask what state is the security sector in right now? What is it capable of? What is each force capable of? What are What is the history? What are the needs? What is, what is the status quo of the security sector as it currently exists? Then you can move on to a threat assessment, which looks at the regional or the national context of threats from all angles and decides what is it actually um, that we need to respond to? What are our visions and our priorities, our, our, our principles around which, what we're going to consider a threat? And how is the security sector going to respond to those things? So that's the outward looking part. Security sector assessment looks inward, threat, threat assessment looks outward to the world. And then a stakeholder mapping and analysis is very useful at this stage because it's going to be the part of the process where you figure out who amongst all of these security sector actors are going to be involved in consultation and drafting and contributing to, to this process as it moves forward. Then once you've got all of those elements in place for beginning a drafting process, this is the part where you can launch into creating a draft. And a draft has several different elements. You'll see there's a chapter on this in your toolkit. But one of the key things that it has to do is set priorities um, and develop definitions. What is security from a national point of view? How, does, how do we understand it as a society, as a nation, as a security sector? And from that, you can move on to, to the other elements of the draft. Once you have a draft, a zero draft, you can move into the fourth phase, which we call consultation and review. This is the part where all different aspects or actors within the security sector are going to be consulted. Probably they already have been in the first version of the draft. But also this is a part that involves public consultation that reaches out to the communities that are concerned, the public whose security is at stake in this national security strategy and ask them what their feedback is. This is then followed by a process of review where all of this consultation feeds back into a new draft. The draft can be adapted to take on board all of that feedback and hopefully lead to a better version of itself. At that point, you can move to the next phase, phase five. At this point, you go through adoption where whoever the political authority that has initiated it is going to adopt the strategy officially and, and so that it can become a basis for security sector strategies moving forward. Often this, or what is really good practice is if this involves parliamentary approval, different countries do this in different ways. Um, and it's not always something that is done, but it does add to the credibility and legitimacy of the process. If you can include, uh, if you can include parliamentary approval as well as approval by the executive. From there, you move then to phase six, which is dissemination and communication. Having a strategy is not enough. One of the key reasons why well-made public policy actually 
doesn't get implemented in at least half of the cases is because it's not disseminated. This might seem surprising, but this is the way that the, the what, what research has shown. Um, dissemination needs to reach out in two different ways. It needs to reach out to all of the actors within the security sector who now have to change the way that they do their jobs on a regular basis to align with the objectives and the strategy for resource use that the NSS has created. And it also needs to reach out to the public. This is the part where you can enhance views of the security sector, you can engage in public dialogue, you can improve um, trust between the security sector and the state, and you can inform the public of rights and obligations by creating and enhancing public dialogue and communication around national security strategy. And then finally, you get to phase seven, which is implementation, monitoring and review. This is where the national security strategy can't just be a beautiful document. It can't be a lovely statement of national values and ambitions. It needs to be a practical tool that changes the way that everything within the security sector works. So it becomes a basis for thematic sectoral strategies, for institutional plans, for procurement, for training, for all of the needs of institutions that have to achieve these objectives. And every institution should be able to say at some point what they are doing to implement the national security strategy. Now, obviously, phase seven is going to last a lot longer, perhaps, than the rest of the phases. And it should also include a, um, a process of monitoring and review. You need to monitor implementation of the strategy to figure out, is it being implemented well? And is it achieving what it was supposed to achieve, what it was intended to achieve? And if the answers to those questions prove to be negative, then you're going to have to move to a process of review, which leads us back to the beginning. If we can go to the next slide, please. NSSD is set out in phases, but actually it's a cycle. It's a circular thing. Unlike a constitution or fundamental laws which enshrine key principles and values on a national level. A national security strategy uses those values, but it has to be a living document that is constantly adapting and changing because security changes. The environment around you changes, the world changes, the public changes, needs change. And a national security strategy is the means by which the government's response to those changes is put in place in ways that it changes and adapts. So you can think about phases one to four, for example, um, taking anywhere between six to 18 months on average. Um, and this is where you go through this process of consultation and preparation and crafting a document of disseminating it, communicating, approving. Um, and you have a new response to new security environment that sets priorities and addresses challenges. From there, you move to phases five and six, which are adoption, approval, communication, and dissemination, also perhaps relatively short period of time. Then you move to phase seven, which is implementation and monitoring. And here, it can last anywhere from five to 10 years or even longer. It really depends on the context. It depends um, on the resources available for review and on the, whether or not a new, a new strategy would be necessary. Um, but this is really, this, this is, says something about the lifetime of the policy and the strategy. And when it is eventually time for a review, that's when you move back into the relaunching phase one. And this is all really um, important because as we've said, a national security strategy has to be a practical document that changes things about the way that the security sector works. And one of the key ways that it does that is because it's a tool for resource allocation. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Here you can see this is a, this is a diagram that is taken from a very well-known um, text that looks at public policy resource management. And the basic idea is that in the outer circle, you have the process of national budget development, resource allocation, execution, oversight and reporting, evaluation, and then back to objectives. This is the way a national budget cycle works. So within that, the security sector, which can and should always be subject to the same principles of rational, effective resource management, should fit within that cycle, whereby there should be security sector strategic planning, this should lead to budget preparation and resource allocation, which leads then to 
the implementation of planned activities, monitoring for effectiveness, and then evaluations that will eventually lead to, to a reorganization of that strategy. The national security strategy drafting development process and its implementation lies right at the center of that process of allocating resources on an efficient, transparent basis within the security sector. It should be the key, the key reference document by which objectives are set and resources are distributed. Um, and this is really important because it needs to set a prioritization of responses. One of the problems with facing security for, for security sectors that as soon as you say security threat, everything is important but we can't respond to all the threats and not all the threats are equally important. So prioritizing which threats are most important and allocating resources on that basis becomes a really important way that a national security strategy can influence national resource allocation. And one of the ways this happens is way that there is a hierarchy of sectoral policies and strategies that are then based on this overarching framework. So if we move to the last slide, please. Here you can see, um, in, with many moving boxes, you can think about um, the policy making context in any national context. You have an overarching national framework for policy coordination. This will be things like your national development plan. If perhaps in a fragile context, there's a plan for national re reconciliation, it involves all parts of government and society. The national security strategy sits as just one component within that overarching national vision, but it is focused directly on national security policy and strategy. It sets the priorities, as we've just said, and creates this division of labor, who within the security sector should be doing what to implement a strategy. That division of labor then gets translated into sectoral policies and strategies based on the national security strategy. Now you can see, the boxes that are in dark blue are really the classical sort of actors or sectors you'd think about when you think of security. You're going to think about national defense, defense policies, you're going to think about internal security, you're going to think about justice. Okay, and that's great. And then those policies and strategies need to bring together how those actors will interact. But security is broader than that, as I'm sure you've covered. And that means that there are other aspects of government service provision, which also need to be involved. So the national security strategy is going to be, is going to touch on elements of foreign affairs. It's going to touch on elements of health and education. I think it should be clearer to us than ever before how pandemics and public health emergencies have security implications. There's also questions around national resource environment, environmental management, um, for example. These are other, and there are more, there are other sector or related sectors of government service provision, which will be tangential to national security strategy implementation. And then finally, this needs to filter down to the institutional level. Every part of the security sector should be doing its job in such a way that it can say how its work contributed to these national objectives. So you have the armed forces and all of its branches, you have border guards, um, you have civil defense forces, all of the intelligence community or, or a single agency, depending on how it's configured. You have wildlife protection forces, for example, police, justice and prisons or corrections, each of these actors should know what their role is and how they're contributing. Now, this all sounds um, perhaps, uh, I've, well, put it this way, it's a complicated process, but it's a process that uh, many countries have completed, if each in their own way. But as Dr. Luca mentioned, there are some very specific challenges associated with this. Probably the key challenge is to ensure that there is top level political buy-in um, to push the process forward at each stage. Wherever there are disagreements about some of the fundamental definitions, wherever the process becomes politicized, wherever resources need to be mobilized or things just need to be pushed along, it seems to be a pretty general experience that um, top level political buy-in is critical for pushing the process forward. And some of the process, some of the, the impasses that you're going to face, perhaps, in this process, one of them, a key one, is poor planning. 
think back to phase one, planning initiation, there needs to be a clear process set out from the beginning. It needs to be clear who is leading it and um, how it will be moved forward and who will be involved and what their roles will be from the very beginning. And what we have seen in um, several experiences is that where this is not the case, then the process can get stalled at some particular point, whether it's consultation or development of a draft or disagreement about definitions. And without a clear process in place, including deadlines and allocation of resources, it can, it can get stuck there. there. A next challenge or related to this is insufficient resource allocation. You need to think right at the beginning about how much money it's going to cost for the process to move forward and what people resources you will need, what human expertise will be necessary. Now, one of the things that about NSSD, as you've noted, is it can become as big and as expensive and as long term as you would wish. And usually... Um, resources are limited and the process needs to be truncated to fit within the practical um, budget realities or resource realities of each context. So making sure that in the beginning you design a pragmatic process that can lead to a useful document within a useful time frame is really critical. Um, and sometimes that will require then high level decisions about what is going to be in and out and who will be involved or not. Another problem that often comes up and this may seem a little philosophical, is a failure to get clear at the very beginning on the fundamental principles and core definitions. What is the overarching vision for security on a national basis? What are the values that are important? Whose security is at stake? And, and by what measure, by what principles should this be, should this be um, advanced or embodied? And that, that sounds perhaps like um, abstract philosophical talk, but it's actually really important for when you move on to some of the more um, practical aspects like threat assessments, like um, defining missions, division of labor. You won't be able to do any of those things. You won't be able to set clear priorities if you don't have clarity among key stakeholders about what security means and what the core values guiding and orientating the process are. So those, those somewhat soft features of national security policy are really important to develop. Another issue that, that can also link to this and then hold the process up is insufficient consultation and inclusion. There is a tendency, especially in security sectors, especially in those with um, perhaps very new democratic trend, um, traditions, that you're facing a culture of secrecy and you're really trying to break down the idea that security is something that only um, men in uniform or security professionals or high level politicians should talk about. It's related to secrecy. It, it's there may be legacies of fear avail, uh, associated with it. And what that means is there may be a reticence or a reluctance for the public to comment. They may feel like it's not their place, for example, to comment on such things or that they're not qualified. And that can lead then to a product that is overly technical, overly narrow, and not really practically useful in terms of that list that we had at the very beginning of what makes a national security strategy a useful document for democratic security sector governance. All of these challenges um, have their particularities and they're linked to different contexts, but the key aspect in this in being able to move forward when the process gets blocked over these issues is dialogue and high level political buy-in. The process itself is just as important, more important even than the written document that's going to result from all of this. So uh, with that, I think, Dr. Luke, I hope I've covered all your points. I will hand Thank you, you back. Thank you very much. And uh, you have really highlighted most of the, uh, the points. One thing I just want to, to highlight the issue of national ownership. Uh, we, we observe on the continent that sometimes some, you relinquish your sovereignty and you ask some institutions to come and draft for you in some countries, they adopted these cut and paste and in order to develop your national security strategy rather than... So national ownership is extremely very important. And uh, you must be in the driving seat. 
And that's a very important point that I want to, to highlight. And uh, most of this, these things are in the toolkit, and it, especially you will get them. So copy and and paste, and it's not it's not it cannot work. You know, there are many there are many institutions will come to you, and then they would like to draft it for you. They said, you know, we can draft this national security study. You have to use it, and experts coming, they draft it for you. This is a national security strategy. And those strategies cannot work if you are not in the driving seat. National ownership is key. Um, Dixon, please, within uh, 15 minutes, if you can just give us the experience of Ghana in developing its national security strategy. 15 minutes, please. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Luca. And Thank you also, Feli. I mean, this has been a very excellent uh, presentation. Well, the Ghana case is one particular example that tends to follow um, slightly some of the steps that um, Feli put across. And I think that as we go through it, I mean, in a very cursory manner, some of those aspects will become quite clear. So maybe if we can roll to the very first, um, so the first thing that you see is actually the National Security Strategy document of Ben on the very front page. Anyway, the process that fairly outlined, which has been captured succinctly in the uh, toolkit, as I said, has a similar uh, pattern in the way it unfolded here in Ghana. But for those of you who maybe I need to just give clarity about where Ghana is, Ghana is sandwiched between um, Cote d'Ivoire and then uh, Togo. And then south of Ghana, you have the Gulf of Guinea, and north of Ghana, you have Burkina Faso. Now, a little bit about um, Ghana, maybe in about a, a minute, would help. So in 1957, Ghana became independent. And right after independence, 1966, we had the first coup d'etat in Ghana. After the first coup d'etat, it was succeeded also by the next coup d'etat, which came in 1972. After 1972, 1979, and after 1979, we had a matter of all peace in Ghana, 1981. And after 1981, the country had become very tired of all these groups and was now um, in a military dictatorship for 19 years. So it was in the year 1992 um, um, that the first, uh, the fourth Republican constitution of Ghana came into fruition. Now, when that constitution came into fruition, the climate of fear in the country was a very palpable one. And so the demands for security was very high among the population. But right from all this period, I mean, the whole dominant posture of security in Ghana had been much more of regime security, or what Dr. Luka would say, the state-centric approach. So that had dominated the way we look at security for a very long time. But 1992 going also marked a watershed because issues of rule of law, inclusivity of populations have become a very big thing, particularly in the writing of the constitution. Now, um, fast forward after about 30 years, that is um, up to the last three decades of much more of a liberal state. We have been discussing issues now of human rights, internalizing um, issues of human security, versus regime security. And so this is the foreground as to Ghana and how Ghana will then move forward to look at its development of the national security strategy. So first, I want to begin in the manner in which we began. First, the president, right from the 2016 election, had been dropping hints of um, getting human security at the very core lead of state policy. And so when he became president, it, there was, it wasn't a surprise that the matter had come back to roost. The issue about how the security sector ought to operate or fashion had come back. This had fallen into the bigger conversation of security sector governance. And with that, the issue of de developing a kind of overarching document for the security sector also came to be part of it. He created in 2017, the Ministry of National Security. So that's a very important ministry. 
He created the Ministry of National Security and taxed the Ministry of National Security, among others, with the um, policy um, um, coordination aspect for the security sector policy development. And so that is how come the Minister for National Security from the President's direction came to be in the core lead of the discussions on the national security strategy development. And with that set up, the minister then also started bringing together um, a range of actors, particularly the various other ministries and asking for um, a technical working group to be uh, commenced. And that technical working group became known as the National Security Strategy Development Technical Working Group. As a member of that technical working group, one of the first important persons who was appointed was the chair of the working group. And that was in a person of, at the time, Brigadier General Emmanuel Kotia. And so Kotia was um, to uh, galvanize a team of experts within the ministry as well as also within the broader uh, government sphere to set about planning for this document. So for the most part of the uh, initial meetings, the initial meetings focused largely as to the nature of the, um, the document that we wanted, who should be included on, on the table, and what is the scope of the work. So work definition, things like that, became very, very important. And having um, designed the approach that we would adopt. The next important thing also on the mind was then to create a small secretariat. A small secretariat that will actually be in the core lead of drafting the strategy. And so one might decide also clearly, like in the case of Ghana, who and who was going to actually do the writing, I mean, in terms of things like rapporteurs and things like that. I remember very well that at that time that the approaches had been made to the Kofi Annan Center. So the Kofi Annan Center provided us with a group of rapporteurs who would then be taking minutes and things like that. That became a small program around which the, the technical working group now coalesced. So the, the drafting team, uh, people who will be taking the mechanical notes, had actually went also there. A secretariat was then created for that work. The next along uh, all this was to now plan and develop letters of information to various constituents and various people. So we had to draw, had to draw up a wide range of um, lists involving various um, um, uh, groups. So, for example, I mean, the security, past security leaders were one, so current leaders were two. We had to bring in uh, representatives from CSOs representation from various parts of youth groups, religious groups, and to the, and we held one of our very first meetings at um, Akosombo. And the very first meeting was a very interesting one because it was the very first time in our, our history that we had been, we had met to discuss the national security strategy, you know, formulation with, with um, members of government, opposition, um, CSOs, and so on and so forth. And so one could imagine the kind of interest that this had um, developed into. And throughout the discussions, there were, you would find compromises, but at the same time, you'd also find I mean, divergences, I mean, which was quite natural, because they, we could not agree sometimes on the, whether we we're going to have a document that would be entirely a classified document or a document that would be open. There were also contentions, for example, as to uh, like what Dr. Feli said. You had to agree on certain values. I mean, I mean, would it be uh, citizen-centric or whatever? I mean, or would it be um, state-centric and all these things? So given the kind of political history and vicissitudes in terms of security that we have, those tensions were quite very, very uh, robust. You know. And, but along those lines, like I have said earlier on, so there were a lot of compromises. And one has to actually bring in leadership into some of these matters of people who need to build compromises. There were parliamentarians from both different angles. And sometimes one had to do back 
will work with some of these um, um, parliamentarians to build some kind of consensus right before meetings and things like that, so that you don't turn all the engagement into debating societies and debating clubs and things like that. But that type of leadership, um, that would also see some of these divisions were also important. But along all these things, then came the initial part. So the very first initial drafts that came were ones that had been collected from the various engagements that we have had. Now, um, some of these uh, engagements that we have had, had um, were um, mainly um, to uh, enable, 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 us, enable us look at some of the major threats that were in front of the country at the time. And so the um, issues to do, for example, with cybersecurity, issues to do with economy, issues to do with environmental security, matters to do with border security, matters to do with maritime security, issues to do with environmental uh, degradation and climate change and things like that, the broader issues, as well as matters that have to do with um, relationships between uh, Ghana and then also the other uh, countries, its neighboring states, Ghana's strategic interests and how it will prosecute these kinds of people were kind of uh, at the foreground. And the details of it had also to be drafted going to various ministries. So um, in point, sometimes we had invite, we invited memorandum. At other points, we went to some of the ministries. In fact, if you wanted to wait for some of the ministries to give you some uh, memoranda, it, it, I mean, it took literally sometimes months. At the beginning, we had earmarked that this process might take us two years. But as you would see in the later real stages of all this, it took us actually four years. And that would tell you that the timelines that we had set were either unrealistic or that we had set defective timelines or that we were actually overrun by some other considerations that prevented us from meeting um, the very timeline set at the initiation and planning stages. And having um, gone through the length and breadth of meeting different um, institutions like energy, we have gone to energy ministry. Sometimes we took notes uh, with, with the ministers of these or some of the leading uh, aspects within some of these um, uh, uh, ministries. We went there literally. And one of the things that we learned along the way was to actually get um, um, people who would be points of contact. So we termed them like um, NS, NS, the uh, NSD uh, point of contact within the various ministries. You know. And um, by and large, after about, um, so we had a year mark that by 2017 to 2019, the document would be done within the first term of the president, because the elections would, uh, would be in 2020, that's the second term of the president. We could not actually meet that term. And the document moved to its second term. And that is when, uh, so in 2020, I think probably in April, we had final approval of this um, uh, draft document now from the cabinet. Cabinet had met over it, also made its uh, um, inputs into it. And I need mention that before cabinet, parliament subcommittee on defense and interior had also been met. We met them somewhere, I think, in Akusumbo again, and had them. And when I talk about parliament, I'm talking about multi-partisan groups, so you have different shades. But in Ghana, we run a dual politics. So you have a like two type of two horse race, two parties, so more or less like some bipartisanship at some point, and then some uh, different, different um, I mean, opinions come by popping up. But by April 2020, the document had now received parliamentary, uh, presidential uh, cabinet approval, and it was, now ready for launching. So the rest had to do with the planning stages to ensure a proper launch. COVID actually took a bit of an onslaught, and those were some of the things we should have perhaps maybe considered. And eventually it was launched on the, exactly about a year ago, which is about the 7th um, of um, June, 2021. So that is just about a week. Um, the, the last week is just the first anniversary of Ghana's NNS. Now, as fairly rightly said, so you are not done with just with the document. 
I mean, that isn't the end of the road. So the next stages ahead of us have to do with the public dissemination of this document. And um, we were to then look at how we disseminate the document. And we adopted a number of strategies. So basically, we looked at making a document an electronic document that can easily be disseminated I mean, across without, uh, so you have soft copies and soft versions that can be sent across. Apart from that also, various copies were printed and given to the sub, um, sub ministries and then departments, the ministries, the departments and the agencies of, of government and civil society groups had access to it. The public lunch helped a lot in bringing a lot of awareness to it. And then finally came the issue of having disseminated all these uh, across Ghana and also outside Ghana the issue about implementing it. So currently, as we speak, we are within the implementation, the monitoring and the review stages of the national security strategy. Now, the implementation team has seen a number of uh, actions that we have taken here in this country, particularly looking at inclusivity, um, and then also looking at ensuring that the document itself meets certain timelines. So if you look at a document that Ghana created, to avoid the situation where we do not actually know at what stage the document will be in terms of its implementation, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, uh, the last but one chapter actually deals with implementation. And, um, and the, in that area, one would see that we're, we're dealing with sector um, strategies and action plans. And currently uh, also with things to do with embedding national security strategy in national, regional, global policy, as well as also mobilizing domestic resources, uh, program budgets, funding, and so on and so forth. And then also in the bigger issue of aligning Ghanaian national interests around this important document. Now, also within this period, the Ministry of National Security particularly has a, a mandate to ensure strategic communication of this document. And that it does through various forums. I mean, the forum that we've chosen to discuss this matter is one such important one because it builds also consensus and regional synergies with our neighbors, also with our partners and things like that. Clarifies our goals and our interests. You know. But one of the important things, and that is maybe a difference that you might find in Ghanaian national strategy. But whilst looking at this, one might want to look at other national strategies that other countries have. The United States, for example, Great Britain, they all do have national strategies. I mean, these are available online. And one would see that in Ghana's own, there is a tax metric uh, for all elements of the governmental machinery. It is clearly stated there what every unit or every uh, department, MMDA, then that is the ministry or department or agents identified will do. There's also the coordinating mechanism, which Kelly talked about, which has been embedded there, clarified and shaped clearly. So there are national security strategy implementation committee, which involves certain important actors from various ministries. There is also the NSS crisis response team, which is also part of the implementation and monitoring uh, instrument. The NSS budgeting and funding is also something which has been created to enable implementation to happen. So there is a dedicated funding for national security strategy in Ghana, and which is called the security fund. And you might also realize that in terms of monitoring the implementation of the NSS, there is also parliamentary, clear parliamentary oversight of the strategy. So it is not left to the government. Um, Ministry of National Security or alone or the executive branch to have some executive oversight. There's parliamentary oversight that has been embedded into the process. And that also uh, is important to reflect because around every, um, now parliament is supposed to receive this document. In Ghana, it's actually become law now that um, we make the national security strategy available within the first term of the new parliament being constituted. There is also the strategic review that takes place of the strategy. So the strategy is not a secret power. The strategy, there's an underlying assumption is that every four years, that strategy might not be actually appropriate. 
แต่หรือไม่ครับชูลูกครับเป็นองค์ที่ชีวิตเราเคยเป็นชีวิตเราไม่มุ่งจุดเดียวสักการโอเคสำหรับ few lessons that we have learned first one that leadership is very important in this particular matter and that people skills is useful because of the likelihood of conflict as well as divergences and so and also the need for congruity as well as also some general synergies so uh, the person who led our process i think general p u t i a he really had it that really helped a lot we one need to also build through the process and by that i simply mean that it's important that one is able to foresee some of the uh, potential problems that one might be for example in ghana's case the issue of our resources was an issue so right from the one m u t u a l finance was actually d e e p l y involved in it and then also the metrics that had to be developed Um, uh, for implementation, had been embedded in the strategy itself. It was a controversial decision I mean, whether to embed metrics actually in the strategy or not to do so, and that was something that we put in. But for our purpose and looking at the country's history, it's something that has really served as well. Public education can increase awareness and also increase public buy-in, and it's also very important that one realizes the usefulness of the secretariat. So an NSD secretariat with drafters, reviewers, l a r resources to assist is something that can help to ensure some um, efficiency and then fluidity of the processes. Then also the uh, one good lesson that we learned was that in the past most of such security strategies have been hidden. They had been hidden from the public and hidden from many ministries, departments, and agencies of the state itself. And that had not been a very helpful one. But distributing these copies and making them publicly available would help. But that meant that Ghana had decided that the strategy itself was going to be not a classified document. The tactics about how we actually went about to achieve the object of the strategy were going to be the classified ones. And we also had some good lessons or uh, achievements with the NMSZ. POC s t a t s a point of contact within the various ministries, departments, and agencies, which we realize could help to minimize the bureaucracy and bureaucratic red tape. Uh, we also re- realize that the media can be useful in this type of engagement, and that it's important to see the media as PR tools rather than to see them otherwise. And that uh, when we held uh, workshops to educate the media about the rationale and the importance. It actually helped to accentuate the benefit and to build a sense of purpose for the country. We didn't also. Uh, we also felt that one lesson that we had actually gleaned out of the entire process had been the post-lunch workshops, the seminars that had helped to create a functional awareness and a deep sense of understanding about the workshop. And that these things were a work in progress. However, it was something that had to be done, like as in the nature of the strategic. Communication that issues that I talked about previously. Okay, so um, can, can we can we go ahead? So with the, with, with that we come to the end of the Ghanian experience. But um, I I would want to make just two points. That so way back in 2017, I sat in such a class or such an environment like this, and it proved actually to build my knowledge. And ACSS's preeminence in terms of NSC development and guidance really served me well and served me uh, competently when I sat to um, help Ghana to develop our own strategy. And I hope that um, you would also benefit largely and go back to your own countries to develop similar strategies um, in a very uh, effective way. And, uh, thank you so much. Okay, now thank you very much, f e l i and uh, Dixon. I know in the process I lost one or two participants, uh, but not, not not in the way. At least not snoring, but at least uh, <laughs> they took a bit of rest. But I know they were listening as well. So really, very very stimulating discussion. But they, uh, I am just going to ask you again: How many do you know whether your country is having national security strategy? Raise your hand. Okay. So the number is uh, seem to be quite uh, quite uh, like what Dixon said. I think he concluded very well. Is uh, uh, we 
we have been receiving a very good signal, demand signal from many countries to assist the countries. Uh, myself and Joel, we went to Zambia because Zambia, they uh, indicated they wanted to, uh, to, to support them in the process of developing the national security strategy. In fact, even with Botswana, we have even gone further and we conducted, as I mentioned earlier. So we, we are always available, but demand by the countries whether they would like to develop their own national security strategy. So it, it's just something I want you to, but it must be uh, nationally driven. There's a genuine demand for it. And I, I think like what uh, Dixon said, Dixon attended one of our meetings and he went back and he decided to, to push the process from within. And I think like this national security, the Minister of National Security uh, in, in, in Ghana played a very big role in terms of championing with the blessing of the leadership, 